So now to talk us through that report, I would invite the um, Chair of Mental Health Australia, the very busy Jennifer Westacott, to, to come and speak. <laughs> Well, thanks, uh, Lucy, and uh, it's great to be here at, uh, at KPMG, my old home, although I was in the um, other building across the road. Thanks to the Mental Health Commission for your valuable leadership and contribution to mental health. And on behalf of our board who are here today and our members, I want to thank all of you for attending such an important event. I don't say that lightly uh, because this is not just, as Lucy and Gary have said, just another report into mental health reform. Investing to save is, in our view, a groundbreaking piece of work. For many years, the mental health sector has been trying to answer the question, where best to invest? Where best to prioritise funding and services for an optimal health benefit, as well as an economic benefit? Where and how to point governments and the wider community in the right direction when it comes to mental health? and where investment will best assist the one in five Australians who are affected by a mental illness annually. So it's a complex question, a complex question I think everyone would agree that our entire sector asks on a regular basis and tries to answer amidst a climate of uncertainty around program funding, increasing pressures on service delivery and what I would call ongoing but ad hoc and in my view, often uh, lacking in direction and uncoordinated reform at a state and federal level. It always feels like a little bit stop-start and it's not ever clear to me what problem we're trying to solve and what direction we're trying to head. So we've tried to answer this question and we've struggled with it. So when Liz Forsyth and Gary Belfield and the team at KPMG first came to us and said, how can we help? We thought, well, we can throw them all the easy stuff but that will just be another report on the top of another report on top of another report. Or we can give them those challenges that I've just gone through. And it's a challenge they graciously accepted and offered to solve on a pro bono basis, which is an important point to make because as someone who had to account for pro bono work, it's actually very difficult for organisations to do this. And I know from the quality of the work and when you read the report, you'll see that this has been treated in the same way as you know, probably one of the best audit clients. And it's a crucial piece of work that wouldn't exist without that sense of responsibility that this firm has. As we all know, this sector is simply not geared or resourced or funded to produce quality work of this breadth and of this economic accuracy. And we'd love to be resourced that way, but we're simply not. And governments, as I said, are just not looking at this issue holistically. They're often more focused on short-term fixes and obviously uh, fits and starts between election cycles. Um, but, as the report outlines, investment in mental health has to be multifaceted to return a benefit to all. And that's not just the responsibility of government alone. And that's why the report is unique. Investing to save sa tackles a set of complex issues from a new perspective. As Gary said, it's pragmatic, it's able to be scaled, uh, and it goes to that pragmatic set of things that we can start getting on the road to reforming our mental health system. It's actionable, it's scalable, it's context specific. And solutions that not only demonstrate health and social benefits, but quantifiable economic returns to taxpayers and to the community. And this is hugely important. Anyone who's worked at the highest levels of government, as many of us have in the room, it's absolutely crucial that if you want something done, you have to turn it into an economic case. And everyone in the room who's been at those budget tables, at those ERC tables, fighting for resources from other projects, if you can't make an investment an investment as opposed to a spend, if you can't show the economic return, and if you can't show the economic loss, you can't get anything done. So I want to be very clear why what we're talking about when we say invest to save, when we use the word save, because this is one of the things I want us to be very careful as ambassadors of this report that we're very clear in the public discussion of it. Investing to save is not about cutting costs. It's not about finding that $10 billion to return to something else. In a tight fiscal environment, it's about liberating money from less effective programs to more effective programs. 
It's about redirecting it to areas where we can make the greatest difference. It means spending on early intervention so we can avoid the higher costs as people experience more serious mental illness or they experience homelessness and other parts of government budgets have to pick up that cost. Saving means getting better data so we know the effectiveness of spending. And this is something that people say to me all the time. We don't have the data to know whether the money we're spending, which is considerable, is actually returning on those investments. And the report spends quite a lot of time in that. Savings means targeting more spending to non-health programs like employment, like housing, to avoid higher costs with worse outcomes in the actual health system itself. And recommendations in this report are really about avoiding further costs to government and to the wider community in the short and long term. But most importantly, and this is the kind of human side that we actually have to see the report, there is no higher cost than to the individuals, families and the communities than early death. And this is the number one saving we are talking about. If we act on this report, we will save lives. For example, the ABS puts out a very sobering report entitled Mortality of People Using Mental Health Services and Prescription Medication. It reports that persons who access mental health related treatments account for close to one in two deaths. Now, this is a truly shocking figure and obviously a demonstrating human cost. The financial costs are estimated to be $15 billion annually. And the KPMG report shows that if we can provide collaborative care to manage physical and mental health to 50,000 Australians at a cost of $63 million, the savings will be $187 million annually. If we can provide collaborative care to 500,000 Australians, the investment of $600 million will deliver a saving of $1.9 billion. You can see it's a scalable kind of uh, report. We can say, well, if we extend that to this many people, these are the returns. But let's not forget that $15 billion annually. And the investment figures are low to get very, very high returns, of course, uh, in addition to the human savings. As you'll see in the report, recommendation 2.1 calls for a housing first approach for young people with a mental illness at risk of homelessness. The savings on offer here are clear. The evidence shows that homelessness is associated with higher rates of costly inpatient care and many other direct and indirect costs. So 50% of 15 to 24 year olds with a mental illness could access safe and secure housing at a cost of half a billion dollars, 1.5 billion would be saved in the first year and 4.5 billion in three to five years. These economic savings can be captured and almost immediately if we act and we must give these 15 to 20 year olds a better start in life. So it's very clear to me that we've got a report that is able to say, well, here's the economics of this, here's the priority of this, here's the scalable investment, and here's the return. And as I said, it's about then policymakers saying, well, where do you then deploy those liberated funds? So this report is a foundation for further action on mental health, beyond the measures that governments have prioritised for themselves. It's tangible and delivers that economic and productivity gain, not just for government, but for business and the broader community. Now, as the Chief Executive of the Business Council, it would be remiss of me not to highlight the incredible work that's in the report about the economic and societal opportunity that sits right in front of us in our workplaces. And the report suggests and does quite a lot of work on this. There's over $4 billion in savings by improving workplace initiatives, keeping people at work, and providing support for people with a mental illness trying to re-enter the workforce. <clears throat> and I think, Gary, it's like $4 billion if we were just able to increase people's productivity, reduce absenteeism, and these are easy actions for employers. They're not easy contexts, but they're not rocket science to actually try and keep people at work and provide a more supportive environment. So I hope that governments and the business community start to take this report and start us looking at the long journey of reform. And that we look beyond budget and election cycles by adopting measures which create an environment in which such returns on investment are truly possible. So investing to save is not the whole story, but it's a hugely important starting point. Every day, many thousands of professionals, community workers, carers, peer workers, help many thousands of consumers and carers live contributing lives. 
And that range of service settings must continue. But every day, someone is missing out on the services they need, or our system is failing them in really crucial ways. And this report says, where do we start? How do we break it down? How do we do the things that are not part of the mental health system? And it gives a very, very specific to-do list, which is linked to an economic benefit. And I really thank KPMG for obviously bringing their firepower of economic modelling and thought to being able for us to say, here's how we can actually show that that is a return on investment and the investment is worth making. And I think, Gary, the methodology that you've used could be applied to many other uh, reforms. And we've obviously picked the priority reforms, but I think if you took many other reforms, the sort of methodology that you've uh, put in the report, you could say, well, if you use that methodology, that scalable methodology for this investment, you get this return. And I'm hoping we can use this as a tool for judging the priority list, but also the merits of one thing over the other. It's a list for governments to act on. Uh, and it's, we are recommending that it be used in the governance framework and priorities that all governments have agreed in the fifth National Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Plan. And that's also uh, the key point here. In, in the often uncertain and uneasy, unruly political environment that we operate in, mental, mental health should be a non-partisan issue. And this report, I hope, allows us now to kind of put away some politics here. Um, but there's no political currency in failing in mental health. And this, show, this report allows us, I think, to restart the conversation with both political parties about where to spend their money, but it also highlights how that money can be liberated and put to those areas of gaps and opportunities. Now that will require, and I think the report goes to many of this, that does require us as a sector to not become competitive and precious about if we free up one area, we're going to another. And I think that has held us back so often that people can see that something's not working and that we could do better somewhere else but of course we say, well, we're not going to change. Now that requires serious political commitment because I think it's fair to say the trouble with handing governments a report about with the word save in it is they don't take my interpretation of save uh, and they take the other interpretation of save. And that's, that's what we as custodians of this document have to do. Um, we have to use this report and the firepower that we have to argue that mental health has to be part of the national debate at the next election. We have to argue for a separate policy. We need that policy to be released early and we need it to be evidence-based and we've got now a piece of work from KPMG that we can say, well, how does that stack up against the evidence we know that's been thoroughly researched? We need to ensure that the current investment is not reduced and that additional commitments attract additional funding, but more importantly, that we encourage governments to invest in the sorts of things that KPMG have outlined so that we liberate money and that we get better outcomes. And I think we've provided, instead of the usual election commitments, which are just add-ons without big reform or whoever walked into the office last time and lobbied someone really hard, hopefully this provides a really serious framework for an election policy and a set of election commitments. We have to be precise as a sector about what we're asking for and what it costs. And that's what this report is. It is a list, and it is a list that shows the right investments in employment, in housing, uh, in clinical care that will give us the greatest return. I really want to thank Liz, Gary, Chris, Andrew, and the entire KPMG team for their passion, their professionalism, their generosity uh, in producing this report. I want to thank Frank, ah, there you are. Um, for his leadership of this and, and of course our board for their support and Josh where are you and I want to thank Josh because I know how hard Josh has worked with the KPMG team and as someone who used to do these reports as a partner here it was always great when you had a client who wanted to be part of the work uh, it was always a nightmare when you had a client who just wanted to critique the work um, it was always great when you had a client who was invested intellectually and emotionally and passionately as I know you and Frank have been so from tonight, it's my job and it's our collective task to take these recommendations forward and truly do the hard yards to getting it done. Not because it's an excellent report, but because we can't go through another five years of stop-start reform 
We can't go through another five years of floundering vision. We can't go through another five years of mistakes, missteps, uh, ad hoc funding add-ons. We can't keep doing this. And this is not about statistics. This is about people. This is about contributing to the better lives of people. And we have to walk out of here tonight with the statistics, but with the passion that if we get this right, and if we get behind this report, and we use this report as our template for change, that it will be about improving people's lives. And surely, that's what we're all here to do. Thanks very much.